Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail Critics, who are about to become very relevant, and my underwater train finders. You were the reason why this content remains absolutely terrifying. And today, we are going to discuss two words that strike fear into any who follow me. You've known them since the very beginning. British Rail. But not just any particular story involving British Rail, oh no. This is the big one. A story of true horror. Of terror. Of sheer madness. British Railways, which would eventually trade as British Rail as of 1965, was originally established by the Transport Act of 1947, which nationalized the entirety of the United Kingdom's railway system. Prior to that, it had been under control of what was known as the Big Four, which in themselves came into being as a result of the Railways Act of 1921, a process known as the Grouping. The Big Four were the Great Western Railway, London, Midland, and Scottish Railway, London and Northeastern Railway, and Southern Railway. But due to the downslope the railways had been experiencing post-World War II, the government felt the need to step in and fully nationalize the entirety of railway operations in the country. It wasn't something unheard of. A lot of other countries had done that already. The effectiveness of nationalized railways does vary, but sometimes it can work out. A lot of railways actually operate this way even now. Here in America, Amtrak is the American equivalent of a nationalized passenger railway network, although our freight operations are still private enterprise. Now, when I say British Rail encompass the entirety of the UK's railway lines, I do mean the major lines. There were still some small, lighter railways that were left to their own devices, but for the most part, the government now controlled the majority of the rail network in the United Kingdom. Initially, British Railways was divided up into six distinctive regions, mostly based on the territories the Big Four already covered, but if you notice, these are six regions, not four, so they were divided up a little bit differently. The eastern region was the London and Northeastern line south of the Shaftholm Junction and Doncaster. The northeastern region was the London and Northeastern lines that were north of the Shaftholm Junction. The London Midland region was the LMS lines in England and Wales. The Scottish region was just all the lines in Scotland. It was actually pretty simple that way. The southern region was all of the Southern Railways lines, and the western region was all of the Great Western Railways lines. Initially, the reason they divided things up this way was actually to try to make the transition a lot easier. A lot of the previous management and employees of the railway that already existed were still kind of left in charge of their own distinct territories. Even though they were now government-owned, they still operated separately, and it would be a slow process to kind of unify them. This would create friction over time. Some people just didn't want the government to own the railways. They still wanted to do things their own way. And over time, they were kind of forced to accept that this was the new normal when it came to the UK railway network. The first thing that the British Railways Board did was actually to repair the infrastructure. Even though the war had been over for quite some time, there was still some damage as a result of bomb runs, as well as a significant backlog of maintenance. And as weird as it is for me to say, at first, they actually did an okay job. By the early 1950s, the railways, despite technically being on the downslope, were making a little bit of a profit. Not a lot, but they were in the black which, for a government-run body, is actually really good. Government programs have a history of not making any money, of costing a lot of money. British Railways was not just breaking even at the time, but actually making a profit. That's like the golden child of government-run programs already. They were doing a solid job, but the concern was the state of the railways and their future. The railways still operated in a pretty old-school way, 
it wasn't just that they still used steam locomotives, that was part of it, but it was also their general operation. They still used wagon-based freight, for example, and a lot of the rolling stock, including their coaches, were considered old and outdated. The thought was put forward to not only replace the steam locomotives with modern diesels, but to also electrify a significant portion of the major rail lines. Electrification had been proven to be effective, both in certain places in the UK as well as all over the world. Electric locomotives were a lot more efficient. So the notion of trying to invest some of the money they were making into electrifying the lines did make some sense, as well as getting some more modern diesel units. But there was significant resistance to this, actually. The Labour government under Clement Attlee was actually deeply opposed to it because they were worried about the coal industry. The UK had a lot of coal, and still actually does, frankly. But diesels don't use coal. They use oil. Well, diesel fuel, but that comes from oil. If they switched entirely over to diesel units, however modern they may be, the UK would suddenly have to import a ton of oil to fuel them, whereas the steam engines could utilize home-mined coal. Robin Riddles didn't like it either. He was, well, basically the chief mechanical engineer of British Railways, so that wasn't officially his title. Officially, he was member of the Railway Executive for Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. So he was the chief mechanical engineer, what you're trying to say. Just, just say that, you don't have to overcomplicate things. Riddles didn't like it because he felt it would be too expensive to import oil given the large amounts of coal they just had. Under him, the railway continued to order more steam locomotives built, resulting in many of the standard classes that, in their defense, were actually excellent for the most part. New steam engines are great, but they weren't enough to actually replace all the rolling stock they already had, particularly the really old steam locomotives. Some of the locomotives they were using were actually built in the late 1800s. Even if they were going to stick with steam, they still had to replace these old locomotives. They just weren't going to cut it in the modern railway. Not at all. But as a result of future events we're going to get to, most of the new steam locomotives they ordered would not at all serve out the time frame they were intended for. The standard classes were built to last at least 30 years. None of them served nearly that long. And by the middle of the 50s, British Railway suddenly found themselves in a lot of trouble. See, their freight haulage, which had been their main moneymaker, was starting to get squeezed out by road traffic and air traffic. Trucks on the roads were becoming a lot more common, and planes were making it so that if you need something very fast, it's actually better to just put it on a plane, it'll get there tomorrow. Possibly even later that same day if it's staying in the UK. Point was that they were in dire need of something, and they felt that if they modernized themselves and made themselves seem a little less dated, maybe that would fix a lot of the problems. It actually would mostly result in a lot more problems. And let's talk about that, because this is where things get absolutely horrifying if you're a fan of trains at all. To call the modernization plan a horror story is probably an exaggeration on my part, I admit this, but I'm sticking with that because I don't think they could have handled it any worse. Though I will admit there were parts of this that actually turned out all right. The report that the modernization plan comes from is formally known as the Modernization and Reequipment of the British Railways. It was officially published in December of 1954, and it was meant to bring the railway system up to date. A white paper that was produced in 1956 stated that the modernization would help eliminate British Rail's financial troubles by 1962. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's um, that's funny to me. Um, hindsight is 2020, I know, but wow, that's wrong. The actual goals highlighted for the plan was to increase speed, reliability, safety, and line capacity. The total cost was projected to be about 1.24 billion pounds. In modern money, that's about 30 billion pounds, give or take. So even by design, the modernization plan was going to be outrageously expensive. The specific areas that were going to be covered during the plan was the electrification of principal main lines, such as the ones in the eastern region, Kent, Birmingham, and central Scotland. This is the part of the plan that I think is actually all right. Electrifying lines would allow them to use electric locomotives. In the long run, that could save them a lot of money. So that part's okay. Large-scale dieselization to replace steam locomotives. Now, that's a double-edged sword because we already talked about the coal issue. And as someone who, again, has hindsight in his favor, I know how badly this went. But on paper, 
A lot of other rail lines were doing it all over the world. Steam engines were being replaced, and a lot of railways were seeing success with the diesels. So, in their defense at the time, with the way they were looking at it, if they handled this well, they won't, but if they had handled it well, this wouldn't be the worst idea either. New passenger and freight rolling stock, that part also makes sense. A lot of the rolling stock they were using, such as the cars, just were old. They needed to be replaced. Simple as that. Resignaling and track renewal, another excellent idea. A closure of a small number of lines that were seen as unnecessary in a nationalized network, as they duplicated other lines, which also makes sense, as well, and this is a big one, as the building of large freight marshalling yards with automated shunting to streamline freight handling. This is a terrible idea. The reason why this is bad is that a massive amount of money went into building new marshalling yards and investing in old ones when small wagon load traffic that they were still using was in a really, really steep decline. Modern railways use containers. Wagon load style trains were inefficient and were rapidly being scooped up by truck traffic. These new yards weren't going to be new at all. They were still utilizing old school techniques that were no longer going to be working. And they should have known that, but they ignored it, believing that if they just add more yards, it'll increase their overall efficiency and that'll fix the problem. It didn't. This would be a massive, massive waste of money. But more on that in a second. Now, the electrification of the lines actually went okay. That part of the plan, like I said, was a good idea, and it went all right. It resulted in the procurement of a lot of new electric locomotives, most of which were actually decent. Like, the vast majority of the electric locomotives that British Rail got their hands on were actually all right. But what about the diesels? That's, um, let's talk about that. But let me preface this with the fact that when it comes to these diesels, I'm going to be referring to them by their TOPS classifications. Now, the top system is actually one of the better things that British Rail would wind up implementing in the long run, but TOPS wouldn't actually be a thing until the 60s. So these diesels would have been called something different when they were first built and introduced, whereas they would have been given a new TOPS classification later. But just for the sake of clarity and efficiency, just so we know what I'm talking about all the time, I'm just going to call them by their TOPS names because that's generally what everyone calls them anyway. Now, like I said, the modernization plan called for the large-scale introduction of diesel locomotives. Initially, a total of 2,500 locomotives for mainline service were to be procured in 10 years, at a cost of about 125 million pounds. That's a little over 3 billion in modern money, which is still a lot of money, but the total program was going to be a lot of money, so fair enough. They also wanted to replace much of the existing pre-war passenger rolling stock with over 5,000 diesel or electric multiple units. That was going to cost at least 285 million pounds, roughly 7 billion in modern money. Electrification, of course, was part of this, but the diesels were actually meant to be a stopgap in the long run. In the end, they wanted most of the routes, the big ones especially, to be electrified. The diesels were meant to replace the steam engines, and then they themselves would be replaced by electric units further down the road. It sounds weird, but on paper it probably made some level of sense, as the plan didn't actually call for that many diesels initially. They thought the diesels would be efficient and fast enough that they didn't need as many of them as they needed steam locomotives, if that makes any sense. By the end of this whole thing, and with the acquisition of 1,100 electric locomotives for about 60 million pounds, 1.5 billion, plus another 125 million pounds, or 3 billion, for the electric infrastructure, the diesels would then be used for more minor routes as well as shunting and certain freight movements. But this was a complete reversal from the way British Railways had been doing things. Initially, British Railways was full tilt into steam locomotives. In fact, in its early years, British Railways had largely halted work done on the Big Four's experiments with diesel traction. The only ones that actually saw any significant use would become the British Rail Class 08, which they wound up building a ton of. But barring that exception, mainline diesels were out of the question, at least for the first decade or so, until the modernization plan decided, oh wait, no, we're gonna build all the diesels in the universe. Even though they were still in the process of filling orders for the standard steam locomotives, they then, at the same time, were starting to identify contractors that could build diesels specifically to replace the steam locomotives they were still in the process of building, which seems really counterintuitive. Like, you're building more steam locomotives, 
they're only gonna last five years, why would you build them at all? Now the idea of implementing diesel traction, especially in those days, did make some logical sense, like I said. A lot of railways found cost-saving measures within diesel traction. It was a good idea at the time. But they didn't have that much experience with diesels. The UK was definitely behind the curb. Over here in America, EMD had been doing work on diesels since the 30s. The Big Four had only really started seriously messing with diesels after World War II. So most of the workforce when it came to procuring diesels within the UK was severely inexperienced. The plan was to commission orders for 174 diesel locomotives from six independent manufacturers. Due to politics, as well as currency concerns, they insisted that every manufacturer be in the UK. Which is part of the issue. Like I just said, most of the UK manufacturers had no experience building diesel, like, at all. They had no idea what they were doing. They had been building steam engines all this time. So this was a very, very new thing for them to be doing. Now, building 174 total diesel locomotives just for testing actually does make some sense, though. That's not a lot of diesels, like, at all. And in the long run, they would need thousands. So to build a few, you know, a few hundred, just to test them out, see where the problems are, that's reasonable. That's a good approach. That is not how this went, though. Due to political, of course, and economic events, British Rail's financial position was worsening. Their accounts had shown an overall negative balance since 1954. In 1956, their net revenue fell into the negative for the first time. Costs were climbing, and the market share and volumes of both passenger and freight were falling. They were also facing a bit of a manpower shortage. So, the British Transport Commission, or BTC, and BR management decided to expand the pilot scheme to hasten the introduction of diesels. In May of 1957, which was a month before the first locomotive ordered under the original pilot scheme, the English Electric Type 1s, or Class 20s under tops, entered service, the total orders were increased to 230. Not an unreasonable increase, but then in late 1958, as their financial balance approached an annual loss of 100 million pounds, and before many of the diesels that they actually ordered were built, they further accelerated the whole thing to introduce 2,300 diesel locomotives by the end of 1963. A insane increase on diesels that you have not yet managed to test. Many of these diesels hadn't even entered the prototype stage. Many of them were ordered literally off the drawing board. They had a drawing, a drawing of the diesel, and they said, yes, I would like so many of those. Numerous different manufacturers were being required to produce their own designs to meet various deadlines. And this is a problem, because part of the modernization plan would be to standardize the railways. That was impossible. The manufacturers were rushing, and all of them had very different ideas of what diesel traction in the UK should be. The locomotives they produced were largely incompatible, and some of them worked completely differently from each other. The Deltics were wholly unique, the diesel hydraulics and diesel electrics didn't get along, and even among the ones that used the same kind of traction, you know, all diesel electric, were still woefully different in terms of inner components. There was no cross-compatibility, there was no standardization, there was nothing that could have resulted in a decent, efficient railway network. It wasn't just that they produced a lot of bad diesels. They did do that, but they also produced a ton of rolling stock that was in no way meant to work with each other at all. They had the same rail gauge, they had the same couplers, but beyond that, they were internally different and consistent and effective maintenance on these things was going to be a complete nightmare. There were a total of 14 distinct locomotive designs. Any benefit or cost savings they could have gained from switching over to diesels was completely lost because of the incompatible nature of the diesels. Remember, these designs were meant to be ordered in a very small number and tested and put up against one another to decide which ones worked the best for the rail lines. Instead, they just wound up ordering a ton and threw them out there and hoped for the best. And it didn't help, I promise you. It didn't help when a significant portion of the designs were actually terrible. The reason why British Rail becomes a meme on this channel is that one of my biggest draws is the top five worst trains ever list. I have been doing that since the very beginning. And almost every single list has at least one thing from British Rail. And why? Because a lot of the diesels they produced during this time were absolutely, unconditionally, unspeakably terrible. Just the worst. The Class 15s, the Class 16s, the Class 17s were all garbage. The Class 21s 
caught fire. And those are just a handful of examples. By the early 60s, the reliability and availability of the locomotives uh, was proven to be just not there. They, they didn't have any. And availability is one thing. If a locomotive can't pull a train, that's a problem. You gotta replace it with another locomotive. But what if it broke down on the main line? Then that train is stuck there and those passengers are inconvenienced. But also, any trains behind it that need to use that line uh, can't go, because there's a train in the way. They have to take time to move it. That's a lot of time that's lost. And it only made British Rail look worse to the public eye. If people are trying to use any kind of travel system, they want efficiency. They want that thing to appear at the time it says it's going to be there, to leave at the time it's supposed to, and to arrive when it says it's going to. A little bit of delay is sometimes understandable, depending on the person, but these were massive, unspeakable delays. And you're already struggling with ridership retention. Now, your trains aren't even operating. At least when they were still using the steam locomotives, mostly, the steam engines were old, but they worked! And the heck of it was, a lot of the locomotives that they even got, even the ones that worked, were found, ultimately, to be rather useless. See, they ordered them on a like-for-like -like basis when it came to replacing the steam locomotives. As an example, large numbers of light-duty diesels were meant for local mixed-goods services. But the orders failed to take into account the decline in local and branch-line goods services meaning they had a bunch of diesels sitting around to replace the steam locomotives, when in reality, they could have just reduced the amount of locomotives overall and been a lot better off. Also, and this is very important to me, they ordered an absolutely insane amount of shunting diesels, but that was for their new marshalling yards. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, container freight was taking over, and many of those diesels they ordered would only work a few years before they would be scrapped anyway. It was a complete waste of money. The other thing the modernization plan failed to do was redefine what the purpose of the railways was. British Rail was trapped being bound by the Railway and Canal Traffic Acts, which meant that it had to provide carriage for virtually any type of goods, regardless of quantity, between any two stations of the network at set and published rates. This is a problem, because this legislation dated back to the 19th century, the 1800s, and it was meant to prevent the railways from abusing their monopoly as the sole practical long-distance transport provider. It was basically the British equivalent of the ICC. They were established for the same reasons and were outdated for the same reasons. At the time, it made sense because there was really no competitor when it came to long-distance traffic with the railways, but now we had planes and cars, and road freight operators had no legal restrictions and could turn down work that was uneconomic, and British Rail couldn't. They could also easily undercut British Railway's carriage rates, which the railway could not alter without legal consent. This is all hilarious to me, by the way, because I thought, I was under the impression, that the whole point of a nationalized railway network was to avoid all the government nonsense bureaucracy that comes with being privately owned business. Why can't they just change the law for British Railways? You don't have to worry about a monopoly anymore. You own the rail lines! You are the rail lines! The government was literally shooting themselves in the foot on this. That same act also forced British Railways to maintain thousands of goods yards and other facilities, plus rolling stock and staff to service them, even when there was ever-decreasing demand for those services. This problem had actually dated back to the Great Depression, and the Big Four themselves had campaigned to repeal the act during the 1930s. But that didn't happen until the Transport Act of 1962 gave British Railways, finally, freedom of contract. The timing of the modernization plan was also really bad, because just months after its publication, the train driver's trade union, ASLEF, called a strike that lasted 17 days, and that caused a major disruption on the network. Many of British Rail's long-standing freight customers were forced to start using road transport and never returned to the railways after that. How do you let a strike last 17 days? Could you not negotiate in that amount of time? I mean, come on! As you might imagine, like any government program, the total cost of the modernization plan was vastly more than they actually prepared for. It exceeded 1.6 billion pounds. That's about $34 billion in today's money. And their losses only increased as traffic volumes and market share continued to decline. Some of the locomotives they did get were successful and would go on to have very long service lines, but many were absolutely atrocious and cost more money than they ever saved British Rail. And those fancy marshalling yards they built? Well, throughout the 60s, as wagon load freight declined, many of them wound up mostly empty. Another complete waste of money. 
It isn't so much that the modernization plan was a bad idea. Their railways did need to be modernized. The UK's railways did need to be modernized. But the way they went about this is nothing short of a complete disaster. The only good that ever came out of it was the electrification. They did get a lot of that done. And like I said, a lot of those locomotives were actually okay. It did help increase efficiencies in certain areas of the rail line, but the inefficient deals they procured, plus a lack of use for the marshalling yards they built, meant that there was no way to recover the amount of money that they put into this thing. It would be a long time before British Railways would get back on track, and in fact, its struggles would result in another major aspect of British Railways history, and it's another element of horror for any rail fan, as it left many rail lines either abandoned or outright destroyed. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Sundu 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoff 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, DM Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Twin Fox, Dimeblade 17, Anzac A1, Alaric Jaspers, Tommy Rossini, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, and Ty Hammonds Jr. Till next time. This is Darkness, individual of Fond, farewell.